Hey, everybody. We're just getting set up here. We're going to give folks a couple minutes to join. Really excited to be with you. Feel free to drop in the chat where you're chatting in from or joining us from. We'll get started here in just a minute. I think I scared everybody away, Cliff. Suddenly the chat went really quiet as soon as I was like, hey, just you know, give us a shout where you're chatting in from or joining us from. <laughs> yeah. We have some attendees who are flying below the radar. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, you know, they're trying to perhaps proxy their uh, their webinar experience. So <laughs> see a bad, couple bad different bad comments jokes. represented. Yep. Austria, nice. Cool. New York City shenanigans. Yep. Seen lots of that. Atlanta. Hello, everybody. Denmark. Very cool. Long Island. Barcelona. Nice. Or Barcelona. Excuse me. Let me get that correct. India. Great. Well, uh, you know, in, uh, been to parts of India myself. This is awesome. Hyderabad. Okay. Yeah. Seen lots of, lots of, uh, from New York City and, and, uh, uh, boroughs. That's great. Poland. I love the representation. This is great. All right. Let's, uh, let's kick things off. Uh, Maciej. I think we're good to go. Welcome, everybody. All right, so hey, uh, I'm thrilled to guide you through the newest part of our journey on the Trail of Beast Testing handy, Handbook. And today we continue our webinar series with tips and tricks uh, for Burp with our special guest from Portswigger. So before we dive into the content of the webinar, I would like to take a moment uh, for our team to introduce themselves uh, personally. So I will start briefly. So hello, everyone. I'm Maciej Domański, Senior Security Engineer at Trail of Beats. I'm mostly interested in application security, mobile security, and static analysis. So now I would like to invite Cliff to introduce himself. Please go ahead. Hello, my name's Cliff. Uh, I'm another security engineer at Trail of Bits, uh, also focusing on application security work, a fair amount of web work, and Burp Suite is where I cut my teeth. So this is a, a comfortable and happy happy subject to be discussing with everybody today. Thanks. Now let's hear from Keith. Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you all. I am Keith Hoodlett. I am the director of AI, machine learning, and application security here at Trail of Bits. Uh, I've been using Burp Suite now for, gosh, it feels like close to 10 years or more. Uh, so love to see the journey and the growth in the product. And uh, especially excited to be joined by Albino Wax, uh, the legend himself. Uh, so James, if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Hey there. Uh, yep. Uh, I'm James Kettle. I lead the research team at Portswigger. Uh, looking forward to seeing this webinar, answering some questions, maybe. Thanks for all those introductions. Uh, we have a great team here today, and I'm excited to share a knowledge uh, of Burp with you. So now let's get started with an overview of the Trail of Bits Testing Handbook. Yeah, so this, this webinar, of course, coincides with the release of the Burp Suite chapter of our testing handbook. But this is really a project that's been going on for first release was, I guess, about a year ago. And it's designed to share with the world in a very open source way the battle-tested advice that we use with our paying clients during engagements for how to not just fix bugs, but really systematize that knowledge and take some of these security tools that can be a little bit intimidating, difficult to get started with, and not only get some impact with them quickly and get over the hump of introducing them, but also make them part of a long-term strategy that can serve you well for years to come, make them part of your development process. Now, Burp stands in contrast to some of the subjects from our previous chapter. Some of the earlier subjects we've looked at are ones that are really difficult to get started with. They're really intimidating. And that's very much not the case for Burp. If you Google how to get started hacking or offensive security lessons, one of the very first tools you will get to know is Burp Suite. So probably most of the folks listening in attendance today and watching after the fact know what the Burp UI looks like and know how to get their hands dirty with it. Um, but Burp is a tool with a lot of sophistication and a lot of power under the hood. And that's one of our focuses with covering Burp in the testing handbook is really helping people squeeze the rest of the juice out of that lemon.
All right, so let's quick let's have a quick uh, introduction to Burp. So generally, Burp Studio is an HTTP interception proxy that sits between your browser and the remote server in between. So uh, basically, requests from your browser are sent to Burp proxy server listening on localhost, and Burp takes all those requests and response uh, and provides several features that facilitate uh, security testing. Uh, the ones that we are going to discuss today are uh, scanner, repeater, intruder uh, features, and uh, several extensions. We are not going to cover how to use these tools from the ground up. For those details, you can check out our chapter in testing handbook at appsec.guide. And what we will be covering here are like lesser known tips and tricks for these features used by us, by James or other TrailBiz uh, engineers to uh, discover web vulnerabilities more effectively. So uh, the first feature we are going to discuss is a scanner, which basically crawls a selected host or set of requests and audits for common vulnerabilities. So you don't have to remember all your um, like basic um, injection payloads and so on. But however, getting the most of the scanner involves a bit more than just right click scan. There are a few settings you can adjust that might help reduce uh, false positive, improve performance, and maximize the chance to, to hit a bug. Uh, we recommend to uh, explore these uh, options and choose the ones that are most tailored for your needs. For example, you probably want to uh, limit your, your scan to the host only that you, is in your scope of the, of the assessment because it's like, uh, natural and you don't want to waste time like sc scanning other ones. And additionally, what we usually use as we select audit coverage maximum in the scan configuration to ensure that we get the most comprehensive scan possible. Um, another feature uh, related to scanner that sometimes get overlooked is logger type because usually we have uh, scanner findings in issue uh, tabs. But Generally, when we are looking at uh, logger tab and we look for 500 for 502 uh, responses, there might indicate potential bug, and it's like a great uh, point to further uh, research. And um, James, how it be behaves that, for example, um, audit coverage maximum gives you, let's say, more bugs? Uh, yeah. So. Any scan that you do is basically a balance between how deep you 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 want to go and, and how fast you want the scan to finish. Uh, any payload that, that you send in isolation has a fairly low chance of of working, but some payloads are more likely to work than others. So by saying audit coverage maximum, what you're saying is, I don't care how long this scan takes. I don't care uh, if any given payload only has a one in 100,000 chance of working. Just try every trick you've got. Throw the kitchen sink at this website and let me know how it goes. Thanks. So um, let's go through repeater. So basically, repeater is a tool that, you know, get some requests and you want to work a bit on it. So the first tip is to assign the a hotkey to issue rep re repeater request to control R or command R on macOS in hotkey settings. So usually you can quickly right, change some part of the request and then like bump on control plus R and it, it's pretty easy and quick. Uh, another tip is to use hack vector extension uh, inline requests. So for example, you want to have like randomized IP each request you send, or for example, you want to have a SHA-256 hash or uh, base64 with some URL and encoding and so on and so on. So actually it's like a basis to, to tinker with any request. And another one is um, hack stuff. So for example, you want to uh, go a bit deeper and for example, inject a null byte. So first you can use hack vector for this too, but take a look at logger tab and you can open up hex tab and pull your, uh, for example, null, null byte there. And uh, James, what are your favorite repeater features when working on security assessment? Uh, so I, I, I love everything about 
repeat it and often uh, end up with hundreds and hundreds of repeated tabs. And one thing that's not well known is if you have hundreds of repeated tabs, that actually significantly slows down Burp Suite and makes the UI kind of laggy. Uh, but the good news is we've, we've fixed that. There's a release coming out hopefully later this week, which resolves that issue, which means you can have as many repeated tabs as you like with no performance issues whatsoever, uh, which I'm quite excited about. Yeah, happy to hear that. And yeah, so Burp Intruder is another tool that the way I think of it is it's one of the most important tools to narrow the gap between having an idea of something you want to try in your head and actually generating the, the requests to do it yourself. So it's a one of the most common actual attacking tools used in Burp, aside from the scanner itself. Um, a few non-obvious tips about how to use this tool. The payload markers, that section symbol, can actually go in the URL itself. So that can be used to potentially even change the host name that you're speaking to if you have some kind of service where subdomains are really a, a parameter or, or a request argument. Uh, we're going to be talking about extensions in a bit more detail later on, but Tabberator is an extension that gives you a tab-based interface to Burp Collaborator. One of the less obvious features that that extension gives you is this special dollar collab please placeholder payload. You can inject that into your word lists and have a collaborator payload inserted there automatically by the Tabberator extension. Another, another tip that can save you a whole lot of time. Uh, we normally, when we, we do testing handbook work and webinars, we try not to just repeat too much content that's already in the, the manuals that Port Swigger and James and his colleagues have gone to such lengths to document for us already. But we're going to kind of make an exception here with regard to the intruder attack types, because we see a lot of folks who just know, OK, Sniper, that will that will jam the payload in each of the, the insertion points where I need it to go. And they're missing out on some of the potential value of the different attack types. So. As the documentation explains, you can either have one payload set or multiple payload sets, and you can iterate through those insertion points or payload sets one at a time or simultaneously. So hopefully these examples will help visualize it. Sniper goes one at a time. Battering RAM, if you have multiple insertion points, the chosen payload goes in each one of them at once. Pitchfork lets you iterate across multiple payload sets at the same time. And finally, Cluster Bomb is the really fancy one. It gives you the full Cartesian product between multiple payload sets. And of course, that will increase the number of requests you're generating with one intruder configuration significantly. And of course, the, you know, the Saturday morning special finger wagging reminder, be careful. Remember to check your request pool configuration, know exactly how much traffic you're sending and how quickly you are sending it. So be a good responsible net citizen whenever you're you're generating this kind of uh, this amount of attacking traffic at once. Great, great. Um, so I interject one one thing there. Sorry. So one common question that we get with Intruder is why do the why are they called things like Pitchfork and Cluster Bomb? Like where do those names come from? And well. I heard a rumor uh, that at the time that this feature was developed, uh, da uh, David, who made Burp Suite, was playing a lot of uh, worms. Nice. Cluster Bomb is Love definitely it. everyone's favorite explosive weapon from the words Worm series back in the day. Yeah, it's a, it's a throwback for sure, James, especially given um, I'm sure many people are like, worms, what's that? So <laughs> maybe maybe we've just turned a bunch of people onto a, a nice, uh, you know, art legendary old game. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, yeah, for now, we want to spend a bit time on extensions. So basically, we divide extension to uh, two categories, like turn on and monitor. And another is uh, like, a, I have to tinker with a bit and know what I'm doing. So basically, uh, the first category, like turn on and monitor, are designed to automatically run on each uh, birth scanner. Uh, and uh, usually you have to look at results that appear in issue activity pane of the dashboard tab. And um, you can easily download them in the extension tab, like active scan plus plus, backslash power scanner, software vulnerability scanner. 
and so on. So it's pretty easy to configure them um, and results are, are very, very good. Uh, and I think that James Kellow is author of a couple of them here. And uh, James, what are plans for the nearest extension releases? Uh, we've got some pretty cool extension stuff coming up. So one that we recently released but haven't talked about much is uh, is WebSocket Turbo Intruder, which lets you do massive scale fuzzing attacks on WebSockets. Uh, it's still in progress, but it's already really quite powerful. And we think that due to lack of good tooling, WebSockets can be a good place to find some pretty nice bugs. Uh, also, uh, in my Black Hat presentation, uh, next week, I'll be releasing a major update to one particular extension, which I'm not going to name, but watch out for that one. Uh, and also, earlier this week, we released an extension called Bypass Bot Detection, which helps deal with WAFs that recognize Burp Suite by doing TLS fingerprinting. So it, it shuffles up your ciphers in order to make you harder to spot. Nice. Yeah, love the emphasis on WebSockets, given that people forget the ways that the same origin policy just kind of skips over that entire protocol a little bit. So it's a, it is a great subject for security researchers. But continuing on with the discussion of extensions, some extensions now that fall more into the category of tools to be used even more deliberately, where you really need to understand what you're doing to get the value out of them. A couple of the convenience ones, we've mentioned Hackverter and Taborator already. They will give you a lot of extra efficiency when you're working with Collaborator, a convenient interface, and that Collab Please insertion uh, payload. Hackverter will really speed you up when you need to convert data from one format to another. It gives you this nice XML-like tag interface that you can work with. You can put it basically anywhere in Burp. Authorize is there are several extensions in the App Store that will help you test for access control vulnerabilities, sending multiple requests or sending a request using multiple different privilege levels by changing the cookie or the authorization header. Authorize is one that we recommend. It's very powerful. One of the things you can configure it to do is as you're browsing the site or application using an administrator session cookie, it can follow along behind you with a low privilege, privilege cookie and just try repeating everything that you do and see which requests work just the same when you have a low privilege user. So it can really improve your efficiency in testing for these kinds of, these kinds of bugs. Upload Scanner is a, another very powerful extension that is designed to test for one specific class of vulnerabilities and that those are vulnerabilities involving file uploads. This is one to be very intentional with because under a default do everything configuration, it will send a couple of thousand file upload requests to your target. So if you're using this extension, you are well into the territory of tools that will bring even a very powerful and well-resourced target down if you use it indiscriminately. So be intentional about it, but it can catch quite a lot of different bugs for you. And finally, one of the big ones is Turbo Intruder. So it is a, an extension that gives you a Python-based interface to an intruder-like engine and lets you not only just use the tools that are built into Intruder to generate your requests and process your payloads, convert things from one format to another if you have a specific data formatting requirement, it will let you write custom logic inside your requests. And you know, I would say one of my failure cases when I'm working with Burp is that if there's something slightly complicated I want to do, I'll just get lazy and write a, a little Python script using requests to send, generate the traffic and just proxy it through Burp. But uh, you can, if you understand how to use Turbo Intruder and know how the API works, you can stay within the Burp interface and have access to the Burp API with Turbo Intruder. So it is a big, big efficiency win. Awesome. And thank you, Cliff, for that. So with Turbo Intruder, James, it's one of the most sophisticated extensions we've covered today. Can you share any insights into how it works? Like, is it using a custom HTTP engine under the hood? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So with HTTP 1, uh, it uses a custom HTTP engine that I coded from scratch to be as fast as possible, uh, which is how it can do stuff like uh, HTTP pipelining. Uh, it was inspired by uh, El Camtoff's uh, Skipfish scanner, which I remember the first time I ran that on a target during an engagement. It just 
instantaneously took the target down and I was like, this is amazing. I want Burp to go that fast. And uh, now it can with Turbo Intruder. Uh, yeah, uh, with HB2, it does also have a HB2 engine that I coded myself, but it's a little bit sketchy. So I'd recommend using, using Burp's one. Uh, over time, we've been taking the things that made Turbo Intruder fast and putting them into core Burp Suite and into core Intruder. And we're going to keep going that, keep doing that in future. So my long-term vision is that that is that Burp Intruder should be just as fast or faster than Turbo Intruder. Love to hear it. And uh, on that front as well, given that you're you know diving in, writing code for the engine, writing code for the back end. Um, we also know that you've written quite a lot about getting into research and, and performing sort of really sophisticated novel research. What advice uh, would you give to people that are experienced in security, but really want to get to that next level of being a world-class security researcher like yourself? Uh, cool. Yeah. So, uh, well, the first thing I'd say is I've written a post on this topic. If you Google how to be a security researcher, uh, it should come up. Uh, but th I think the number one thing that I find is people come to me saying, I've got this idea for a research topic, but I don't know if it's good enough. And whenever that happens, like 90% of the time, it is a good idea, but people never try it because, because they're, because they're scared of failure. And even the 10% of the time that it's a terrible idea, uh, I can see it's still something that would teach them something. So my number one piece of advice for doing security research is just try. That is the hardest barrier with research. I love it. The scientific method, right? Just come up with an idea and just go for it. It won't make a difference if you're just thinking about it. Yeah, I remember one of the, the myth busters uh, echoed what James was just saying by commenting that the difference between science and messing around is writing it down. They're just taking a slightly more measured approach that that makes you a professional as soon as you take that mindset. But speaking of both HTTP2 and world-class security research, we wanted to, since we have the man, the myth, the legend here himself, wanted to talk about the subject of race conditions. So uh, the first thing I want to say is I wanted to compliment, James, the title you chose for this particular research paper, Smashing the State Machine, the True Potential of Web Race Conditions. Uh, I, as a reader, felt you were calling your shot by choosing a title that, that harkened back to Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, the nearly three decade old classic. And I, I think you it, you knocked it out of the park with this one. This was a really enlightening paper to very briefly summarize some of the substance of it. Operations that feel like they are atomic because they occur within the span of a single request really are multi-state operations when you have concurrency and state that is shared across different requests. And so with this paper, particularly with the innovation of the single packet attack, you really unlocked a lot of latent potential in not only making the public aware of this type of bug, the fact that it's sitting all around us, and also really unlocked a key technique towards letting people investigating it and helping people uh, use tools like Burp, including Intruder itself, uh, or rather Turbo Intruder, uh, giving folks the tools that they can use to investigate these on their own. It was pretty impressive the way that you were able to get packets and requests to travel literally halfway across the globe and conveniently have the requests be reassembled and arrive with a timing that is sufficiently synchronized to actually exploit these types of bugs. Um, so if you aren't if you aren't paying attention to this class of bugs, reread this paper and. Uh, listen to the rest of this conversation to think through how you might be able to uh, to incorporate this into your own testing methodology. But James, what can you tell us about how the single packet attack really revolutionized this particular subfield in web research? Yeah, uh, I love race conditions. I always will. And the single packet attack is, it's the great equalizer because it means no matter where you are and how rubbish your internet connection might be you can trigger this attack just as well and it means it kind of gets rid of this whole thing of well you found the bug but the developer can't replicate it because it eliminates uh it completely eliminates the biggest source of unreliably 
of unreliability in race condition exploits. This was this is also a subject where we can be tricked as application security people into thinking that our lives begin at the highest layer of the OSI stack. Um, but what do you make of the fact that that people forget that they have all these different other levers they can press on, all these other different components of the the network stack that can be actually deployed to to make these application layer bugs more exploitable? Do you think there's a lot more of that waiting to be found? I think yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done there. Uh, I think people don't people don't like going down a layer because it's kind of unfamiliar and scary and can be kind of time consuming if you don't have have the tooling for it. But once you do that the first time, you get comfortable with it, and then it's it's just like this extra power to hack things, which is really nice. It's kind of liberating. Yeah, absolutely appreciate that. Yeah, so for example, when someone wants to quickly test for race condition, he can use uh, per repeater feature. And that's basically very simple. Like you have a couple of uh, prepared requests in specific tabs, and you must get those tabs together in the group. And you can use a send group in parallel functionality. Just it's pretty easy. and. You don't have to care if you use HTTP first or HTTP second. It automatically uses last by technique for HTTP first and uh, the other one single packet attacks. And James, what are the best, like, what's what's the best purpose of using burp repeater for hunting for race conditions? Where is it? What what kind of functionalities on the web's web is is the best to cover that? Uh, so basically, for any if you want to use the single packet attack or trigger a race condition in general, you, the two good options are Burp Repeater and Turbo Intruder. Uh, they're under the hood. They use exactly the same network level technique. Uh, the big difference is that the repeater is really easy for trying out simple ideas, uh, whereas with Turbo Intruder, you can do things like easily send like 30 requests in one go or easily retry something once every 30 seconds until the attack works if it's uh, if it's reliable. So Turbo Intruder lets you deal with that extra complexity uh, and can even, because you can, you can hook into other Burp Suite tools from Turbo, you can do things like use the collaborator to automatically trigger emails, receive the emails, you visit the links in the emails and kind of get much more complex flows that would otherwise have to be done manually. Yeah, okay. So with Burp Repeater, we usually begin our work with race conditions and then we move into Turbo Intruder. Yeah. Yeah, so the Turbo Intruder extension, we've we've teased it a couple of times and James has just explained how, how it works a bit under the hood, but uh, in if you want to actually use it with a specific request, look under your extensions section in the context menu, and you can send the request to Turbo Intruder just like with Repeater or Intruder. And then James has conveniently shared with us uh, an example script called race single packet attack .py. Um, And James, you were explaining a moment ago that under the hood, the single packet attack is implemented the same way regardless of which of which tool you're using. Um, but I, I thought this this sample script, it's very short and it's a really nice illustration of how much power you have access to if you stay in the Burp interface and use Turbo Intruder to get access to the full Burp API instead of jumping out into some other tool and just manually writing, you know, Python requests. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the other tools generally won't support the single packet attack. So you 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 lose out there too if you aren't if you aren't using it. Uh, probably the biggest issue with this is that you have to write uh, Jython, Jython 2.7, but one, one of these days we'll fix that. Yeah. Vestiges of old Python living everywhere on the web these days. Yeah, so uh, for example, if you want to test for race condition at scale, or we want to like have a broader overview of, of this issue on the big host, we can use a backslash powered scanner and run an active scan. And uh, you can see on the slide that you 
an example issue raised by extension uh, in the issues tab that request inter interference uh, raise. So uh, James, uh, can you tell us about like your the most interesting bug have you found using only burp scanner and this backslash powered scanner feature to hunt for race condition? Uh, sure. So this is an interesting one because uh, it's a different kind of scan check from what most scanners do. Most scanners are trying to find you a complete vulnerability. And if they aren't, if if they can't confirm something is a complete vulnerability, well, then they're worried it might be a false positive and they'll discard it. Whereas what backslash pad scanner and what this scan check in particular try and do is they're not really trying to find a vulnerability. They're just trying to find something interesting that they can then ha hand over to the human user in order to figure out what's really happening. So there's two different techniques that that particular uh, scan uses. And one of them, it basically detects websites that behave differently under stress. So the cool thing there is you can scan any feature on that site and it will spot, well, this behaves differently under stress. And that feature might not be exploitable in any meaningful manner. But if you spot that, you know that website in general is going to be prone to race conditions. So it's worth doing more targeted manual testing on specific features that might have limit overrun race conditions or such like. Uh, the best bug that it found me in the wild is uh, it can spot when requests contaminate other requests that are next to them, which is a great indication of uh, horrendous cloud bleed style bugs. Uh, and it found one of those. So on a particular website, if I sent a bunch of requests, then some of the data that came back actually belonged to other users, uh, which was nice. Okay, yeah, interesting. So don't complain about false positives, just to try harder and go deeper. <laughs> so on that front, James, when it comes to like, you know, seeing data from other users, as an example, uh, it's been almost a year since you published St uh, Smashing the State Machine. How prevalent do you estimate this class of bugs to be? Is there like an ocean of bugs out there to go find, or is it more like a large lake or a river? Like, where do you see in terms of just like legacy code bases and opportunities to use uh, this attack uh, attack vector? Uh, so what I've seen is I've seen tons of people finding really nice limit overrun race conditions using the single packet attack. Uh, it seems like it has genuinely made them way easier to find in the wild, and there's more people looking for them now, which is really nice. Uh, I've only seen one or two of these kind of more complex multi-step race conditions, but personally, I think they are out there. They're just hard to find. Uh, so yeah, I, it's may, it's maybe like it's an underground lake, right? Like you, you've got to get to it first, and that's the hard part. I'm convinced. Got it. That. Got it. Do some cave spelunking, and then eventually yeah. you'll find a, a wealth of it. And in terms of the technique itself, uh, what opportunities do you see for improvement on this technique uh, going forward? Uh, there's a few. So uh, I published a few thoughts on potential ways of improving it uh, on the research blog a, a while ago, and. Uh, someone showed me something they've done and they haven't published it yet, so I can't give you any details, but it's super cool uh, and should come out soon, hopefully. Uh, and also I've, so, uh, I've managed to make some improvements to it as well, uh, which will be revealed in my Black Hat presentation next week. Very good. You're such a tease though, James. We're gonna have to be paying attention to that. <laughs> So in addition to the conversation, some of the questions we're seeing come in in the chat, I want to run a quick straw poll. For the folks listening to this live, if you have ever written a burp extension, either in Jython 2.7 or in Java, to look for your team's specific baseline set of requirements for configuring an HTTP response, looking for these headers or that headers, if or this specific content security policy configuration, for example, if you've written that extension before, I want you to type one in the chat just to see how many people have done that, because I definitely have. And I've burned quite a few hours writing that type of extension. 
And yep, they see him coming in. One of the reasons why we don't need to spend all that time anymore is that we now have B checks. We now have a tool that gives us a convenient and easier to use language that we can use to, to write these static checks and write up the issues much more quickly. Uh, it's less time consuming, there's less to debug, there's less to write, and the resulting product is much more portable. It's just some text you copy and paste. There are plenty of public ones already out there that you can use as a starting point. And uh, yeah, have a look, see how easy it is, and save yourself lots and lots of time implementing these static checks with B-checks. And another cool feature, newest one, is Bambda. And it allows you to write custom filters in human readable language, let's say so. And for example, you are auditing a website and you, in your proxy history, have like one million of items. And you, when you exploit something, you need a specific gadget. For example, only one response that contains specific header with, that behaves in specific way without charts it and with specific response so we can easily like uh write it up um for example hey burp show me responses where the body looks like json but the content type isn't actually json um james do you have any interesting story when it allows you to find a nice bug uh yes yeah, so i make super heavy use uh of bambas for my research uh, the main thing I use them for is just filtering. So uh, I do my research mostly with this 20 gigabyte project file that has 30,000 bug bounty websites in it. Uh, and I use Bambda filters on the proxy history to quickly kind of get different segments uh, to kind of search through and say, well, I want to target all websites that might be using this framework or this feature will have URLs in this pattern or this kind of response header and that kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's really useful for that. Uh, it's probably, it's probably my favorite recent feature and, uh, we're looking at, we're working on putting, uh, it's not just about filtering. So we're looking on letting you do some other extremely cool things, uh, with Bambas in the near future. Yeah. Looking forward to it. So speaking of features, are there any upcoming Burp features that maybe you're able to tease at or uh, talk about like things that you're you're planning to announce coming in the the next week at Hacker Summer Camp? Ah, uh, I should have got a list of what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> uh, I better just guess. So we've got yeah, come we've got a, a new release hopefully coming out this week, which has some massive performance improvements, uh, which I'm super excited for. Uh, as well as the stuff I mentioned uh, uh, about repeater, it renders, it displays large responses so much faster that earlier this week, it displayed one response so fast that I jumped because I just wasn't expecting it to not come back that fast. Uh, other than that, uh, we've got some some really nice updates coming uh, to Intruder. Uh, and yeah, we've got three, the research team has three presentations next week. Uh, so uh, I've got, some research on timing attacks. Uh, Martin has done some crazy stuff with web cache deception and web cache poisoning uh, that's going to cause a lot of chaos because you can exploit huge numbers of sites out of the box with that. Uh, and Gareth's done some really nice research on exploiting uh, email address parsing stuff and has written some extremely scary looking e email addresses. Uh, so that's worth checking out too. I love it. I love it. You've already preempted my next question. So uh, that's very exciting to hear. And we always uh, enjoy watching your research and, and releases of that research uh, at Hacker Summer Camp. So very much looking forward to it. Nice, uh, James. So where people can find you in the web? Uh, yeah, uh, jamesketalk.com and all of those URLs uh, there too. Uh, yeah, the so the, the second to bottom link on that page has uh, details of all those presentations that are coming out next week. Uh, that's probably the most valuable thing to check out right now there. Thanks. Well, we appreciate everybody joining us for this, uh, this event coinciding with the release of our Burp testing handbook chapter. 
it is fully open source. It is constantly being updated. We regularly, as we figure out something new on an engagement, a new way to use one of the security tools that we haven't publicly documented yet, a new niche situation where we figured something out that we think the other folks might be able to learn from. We're constantly adding new information to the testing handbook and making it available to the web. Uh, check out our previous webinars on YouTube. Our blog is uh, constantly being updated with new research from all the different teams at Trail of Bits, stuff on blockchain, cryptography, application security, low-level research, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and you can check out some of our past reports even just to, to kind of show how the sausage is made. These techniques are ones that we really use on a regular basis with our clients. Uh, there's, there's some recent examples where you can uh, find bugs that we found using Burp Suite and using this tool. And I'll give a plug for one of my colleagues also at Hacker Summer Camp, one of our machine learning engineers, Suha Hussein, is going to be giving a presentation as well on some pretty, pretty exciting attacks against the machine learning tool chain. So check her out as well. So thanks everybody for joining us. I believe we are about to transition to our Q&A session in just a few moments here. Yeah, in fact, we've already started seeing some questions come in. There is a Q&A section there on the top right of the chat where you can enter in your questions. We are going to be basing our uh, questions in the order in which they are upvoted. So it uh, looks like some of them may be waiting in for approval, but that said, uh, let me just go ahead and start pulling from the Q&A. So uh, one question I saw that came in was, do you uh, take contributions to the handbook? Uh, I don't see why we wouldn't want, you know, it's an open handbook where if you have a great idea and you want to include some recommendations, I think we'd definitely be open to uh, receiving them for sure. Uh, I don't know right now what our merge policies will be around that, but at the very least, if you have ideas and you want to contribute back to it, we'd love to see your ideas for sure. Yeah, feel free to update our testing handbook. You can send pull requests or ideas or changes in GitHub issues because it's like public repo and yeah, but I think that it's it's a great idea. And I'm also realizing as well, so we want to make sure we're going in and approving some of these uh, for the questions, but as we're going ahead and doing some of that as well, uh, one of the questions that came in was any underrated extensions or burp suite features in your opinion, James? Ha, uh, personally, I think backslash powered scanner is an underrated extension uh it can f it's scarily good at finding server-side injection bugs uh even in uh, even in the presence of crazy scenarios like extremely aggressively extremely aggressive web application firewalls uh in terms of underrated features right now bounders are underrated because people haven't quite got how powerful they are. I think maybe the fact that you have to write Java to use them is a bit in intimidating them, but we put a bunch of effort into getting autocomplete and writing really nice APIs and such like. So what I think is bounders are going to be absolutely huge once this once once the snowball gets going with them. All right, it looks like we're starting to populate in some of the questions now as well. Um, one question that came in, uh, is there an easier way to identify API endpoints uh, without providing definition files? Uh, not not that I'm aware of. I mean, you can try and brute force them with Turbo in, Intruder. You can crawl the site and then uh, try and kind of extrapolate things from the sitemap. Uh, but it's kind of a unsolvable problem. So if you could get the API definition file, that would definitely help. So continuing to go uh, by votes, uh, what is the best way to test for web cache deception attacks? Uh, so I believe Martin is releasing a new call, a new tool to detect these next week, and we're also publishing an academy topic with lots of interactive labs dedicated to that topic and it contains new techniques that will make a lot of websites that no one knew how to exploit exploitable uh, so i would say hang on for next week there 
All right, sounds good. The next one, uh, I'm not sure the context of the question, but it sounds like more of a preference for what you go after when you're uh, perhaps performing testing, which is local storage or cookies. <laughs> this has been doing the rounds. It's still, it's still, uh, okay. <clears throat> it, it's basically local storage is basically secure by default. Whereas cookies, because it's, they're so old and they've got all this legacy nonsense, you have to use about 100 flags to get them close to web security in terms of security. Uh, I have a blog post on this topic uh, and I haven't updated it because some new cookie flags have, been, have come out recently, but they haven't actually changed anything. They're just about making cookies just about as okay as web storage, but ultimately cookies never will be because you've got all these cookie pollution issues that you, that you can have from being from them being injected via other subdomains on the same site and so on, which web storage doesn't have. And for me, that just pushes it into just being well. You can make cookies secure, but web storage just secure by default. That's better. I love it. Left it off a moment ago. Do you get burned out on on security research, and how do you? How do you handle that? Uh, yeah, so I I think, uh, so I don't know if people heard what I just said about burnout, maybe not, maybe I got cut off. Yeah, I, I think was, it looks like as soon as 11.45 hit, we started seeing the folks saying that the, the video gotcha. froze. I, I, okay, so uh, I think burnout can be a threat with research, uh, but it's kind of a signal that you uh, you need to like reevaluate where you're at with this research and like whether this topic is going in the right direction or maybe you just need to like take a step back or take a break, uh, for example, uh, for it, like in, in, in fact, the topic that I'm presenting next week on uh, timing attacks, I actually started that two years ago uh, and I spent six months researching I spent six months researching it and I found some, I found a reasonable amount of stuff, but like not quite enough for a black hat presentation of the quality standard that I wanted. Uh, and I just bailed on it and went into race conditions instead because uh, it used some, some of the same underlying techniques. But then while researching race conditions, I realized like a whole new concept that I could apply to timing attacks like a new application of timing attacks so i when i came back to it uh, i was super excited for it and able to make fast progress and end up with a really solid result i love that anecdote i mean one of my favorite ways to define hacking and there are many is hacking is weaponized curiosity and when you find your curiosity running thin and getting weak that's a sign you just got to change something up to to get it back again and it's it's good to hear stories of you getting better results when you found a way to to keep yourself a little agile yeah absolutely the other thing that i do is i i i, I don't know how important this is but you can't some people you know they do some research and then they present it at like 30 conferences the same piece of research and it's like that that kit for me doing a presentation more than like three times just starts to kill me and i start to hate the topic and i think it's not like a healthy i don't know maybe for other people that's fine but for me i have to avoid doing that yeah absolutely let's see take another look here at some of the upvoted questions uh, there was one we saw in here about security concerns with uh, with Burp extensions. About do we have security problems loading extensions? Do they reduce the performance of Burp Suite? I mean, I can certainly chime in and say that uh, if you're getting your extensions through the B App Store, that is definitely the safest place to get it in terms of vetting and knowing that you're getting what is intended. But James, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's right. So we do source code review. Uh, on extensions that get that that are available via the BAP store and on all updates to those extensions. Uh, so it's decently safe. Uh, in terms of performance issues, yes, extensions can introduce performance issues. Uh, what we encourage, what we would encourage people to do is basically 
only have relevant extensions loaded at any given time. Um, if you're not using them, just unload them. Um, but our, you, our user interface doesn't really make that very easy or encourage it. So that's something that we might be changing in future just to make it really slick to like load and unload them and have like favorites and so on. Excellent. Another one here asking about what burp tools you would use to test for complex cross-site scripting flows. Those that are incubated or second order, for example. James, anything to plug there? Uh, Dom Invader is pretty good with stuff like that. Uh, yeah. To be honest, though, I, I haven't been looking at cross-site scripting in it in a very long time, so someone else might have a better answer. Yeah, Dom Invader definitely comes to mind for me, but Dom Logger plus plus is another big one that's out there right now too in that space. Let's take a look here. Qu question here about recommending researchers or studies focused on digital banking vulnerabilities. And I know that we do some we do some Web three work in our blockchain group at Trail a bit certainly. But James, anything about uh, digital banking that comes to mind for you? Uh, n not really. No, I don't generally tend to focus on specific targets like that. I just like to throw, every throw everything everywhere and see what sticks. Yeah, in the Web3 space, it's certainly it's its whole own thing, its whole own subfield with, you know, its own curriculum to learn from. Any AI features in Burp in the future? Uh, yeah, there, there, there will be, there will be AI features, uh, but well, if we're taking our time, it's because we, we don't want to ship something that's, that's rubbish, right? So when we've got something good, rest assured, we are going to make sure that you get it. Okay. Um, what's your personal opinion with people still using burp 1.7 over, over burp two? <laughs> nah, this is very embarrassing for us. Um, so basically, the only thing that 1.7 has over Burp 2 is performance. Uh, and that's something that we're absolutely hammering. We've had a team working on performance full time for a while now. Uh, and the release coming out this week, coincidentally called 0.7, uh, is going to be a lot faster. And we think it may be faster than Burp Suite 1.7, and it, it definitely will be at some point. And once that happens, we're going to be doing a marketing campaign based on that. We have a question about um, undocumented request smuggler extension features, like you click right on the request and you have billions of options where someone can find any info about that. Uh, so if you hover on the options, it will give you, it may give you a cryptic explanation. Uh, other than other than that, though, it is an open source extension. Uh, so you could read the source code. Uh, generally, if you search for the setting name, uh, that will that's a very easy way to find the exact line of code that is keyed on that setting. Uh, obviously, in an ideal world, I'd love to write amazing documentation for all the tools that I release uh but i've just got to keep doing what's interesting uh and for me that's not writing documentation i'm sorry yeah by the way um what can you say about paraminer is it still a thing uh yeah definitely uh it's i think it's ex it's extremely valuable and for me it's the number one uh extension that i would love to have uh integrated into core burp suite because Program minor, it's super powerful, it's really valuable, uh, but the code the code is so bad, uh, it needs to be rewritten from scratch by professional software developers. Uh, and yeah, yeah, that would be really good. Um, nice. And uh, we have a question from Nicholas Gregory. Um, intruder injection points in the target field affect only the host header or also the server IP? Oh, cool, yeah. Uh, so th the target, in that separate field, that's just about where the request is sent to. Uh, so that that will change the IP address that, that it gets sent to, 
uh, and the SNI uh, TLS field. So we put that in there so you can effectively send requests to multiple different targets. And then if you want to, uh, you can you can change the host header completely separately from that too. So you could do like host header attacks on multiple targets at the same time. Yeah. I think and, for, sorry, really quick, maybe for our last question here um, from the upvotes, there was an ask on any plans for either Trail of Bits or Port Sorger to release content on how to hack modern web applications um, like written in React or Angular uh, or any good resources. I would say just as a resource, um, the Web Security Academy does a fantastic job of covering, I think, a lot of the vulnerabilities for, that Portsuger has already put out there. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, that I think is is going to cover a lot of the ground of like getting people skilled up in the space. But any additional thoughts, James, Cliff, or, or Mache on, um, you know, good training around uh, Angular or React-based web applications? Nothing comes to my mind. Like, yeah, I mean, that might be for us at Trail of Bits a long term, a separate effort that parallels the testing handbook, which instead of the chapters being here's how to get value out of tool XYZ, it's here is attacking this stack for pen testers or, or security researchers, as it were. I love it. It's a great idea, Cliff. And we'll make sure to capture that for sure. Oh, no, I created more work for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Connor, how dare you? Anyway. Uh, awesome. Well, I know uh, we've probably got time for maybe one or two more questions on here. Just looking at the upvotes, um, for many of the options in HTTP, uh, request smuggler extensions, uh, it's, it's, they say it's not documented, they think, um, in terms of the request smuggling. Is there documentation that perhaps we should be pointing people to uh, around that technique or that tool set? Uh, sorry, I already did that one. That one's basically oh. read the source code. Sorry, guys. <laughs> got it. Sorry. Apologies. I might have missed that one. It, it, the request smuggling, it's, there are some, some diagrams out there that'll help kind of demystify that. There was a question, I think, about that somewhere in the, uh, in the stack. But it's another really good example of how the lower layers in the OSI model are actually affecting what's happening at the application layer. They're, those are bugs in how different HTTP servers in the chain between the client and the actual application code can mangle the meaning of the bytes across the wire. So it's another... A, a really beautiful class of bug. If you if you find a diagram that makes sense for you, then hopefully it all it'll all kind of click for you. Awesome. Well, with that, I know that we're coming right up on time. So I just want to you want to pause and say, uh, James, thank you again for spending some valuable time of yours uh, to share information with the rest of us. I hope all of you that were in the session uh, got some value out of this, and we look forward to. Uh, both hearing more from you as we get pull requests, but also sharing more of what we learn and continue to uh, continue to release. James, uh, best of luck and as they say, break a leg out at uh, you know in Vegas when you're giving all your presentations. I, for one, am very much looking forward to what you all share. Thanks. Yeah. See you next week. Take care, everybody. Cheers. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye.